on World News Tonight. Major escalation. NK fires multiple missiles into the sea just the day after launching an intercontinental ballistic missile. Russia hits back. U.S. accuses Russia on crimes against humanity in Ukraine as Joe Biden pays a surprise visit to Kyiv. End of search. The rescue teams in Turkey are dipping down their efforts in the search in order to focus on the survivors. And the carnival is back. The six-day-long festive event bursting to full bloom after three years of themed activities. This is Adaderna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you're joining us on World News and it's a new week and lined up tonight is a series of stories ranging from natural disasters in Brazil, Australia and an update on Cyclone Gabriel in New Zealand to the one year anniversary of the war in Ukraine. But we are starting off tonight with breaking news. United States President Joe Biden has arrived in Kyiv on an unannounced visit days before the first anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Ukraine. Biden's visit was the first to Ukraine since Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered his troops into the neighboring country on February 24th of 2022. Biden arrived in Kyiv, according to reporters traveling with him inside Ukraine, and he said that it's good to be back in Kyiv. He was greeted by the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Bridget Brink. According to a White House statement, Biden said that he was in Kyiv to meet Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and reaffirm their unwavering and unflagging commitment to Ukraine's democracy, sovereignty and territorial integrity. The statement quoted that Biden is saying when Putin launched his invasion nearly one year ago, he thought that Ukraine was weak and the West was divided. Biden said the U.S. would provide Ukraine with a new military aid package worth of $500 million that will include artillery ammunition, anti-armor systems and air surveillance radars. When asked about the significance of being in Kyiv, Biden noted that it was his eighth visit to the city. He added that the purpose of his visit was to convey to Zelensky that the U.S. is here to stay. Zelensky wrote on Telegram that Biden's visit was an extremely important sign of support for all Ukrainians. The visit came as a nationwide air raid alert was sounded in Ukraine, including Kyiv. In December 2022, Zelensky traveled to Washington, D.C. and addressed the U.S. Congress in his first trip abroad since the war began. The United States has begun its joint military exercises with South Korea and Japan. In response to North Korea's recent intercontinental ballistic missile launch, Kim Jong-un's sister responded saying whether or not North Korea uses the Pacific Ocean as its shooting range depends on the United States. North Korea has fired a second round of ballistic missiles in the space of a few days, with the North's leadership warning it would turn the Pacific into a shooting range. The South Korean military says the North shot two short-range ballistic missiles around 7 a.m. on Monday. One flew 390 kilometers and the other flew 340 kilometers towards the EC. A report by North Korea's state media soon confirmed the launches with similar estimates, saying its missiles were fired from its latest 600 mm multiple rocket launcher. The report accused South Korea and the United States of hostile actions, describing their joint air exercise conducted the day before. Flying 10 aircraft, including two B-1B strategic bombers, an advanced strategic asset over the Korean Peninsula, the Allies' air drill was a response to the North launching an intercontinental ballistic missile into waters off Japan's west coast on Saturday. The Hwasong-15 ICBM launch was the regime's first in three months, in apparent protest against the upcoming joint drills by South Korea and the US. The Allies plan to hold tabletop exercises at the Pentagon this week, discussing scenarios involving a North Korean nuclear attack. They will also hold the annual Freedom Shield exercise in March, featuring defense-oriented computer simulator training. The North has always used such drills as an excuse to further escalate its aggression. Regime leader Kim Jong-un's sister was quoted on state media Monday as saying that the frequency of the North's use of the Pacific as a shooting range depends on the actions of the U.S. The South and the U.S. believe the North is likely to increase its provocations over the coming weeks as it has key state anniversaries and a satellite launch coming up in April. Since last year, Seoul and Washington have been looking at ways to strengthen their extended deterrence policy, which promises the U.S. will aid its ally under nuclear or conventional attack. 
According to Seoul's Joint Chiefs of Staff, the two allies are also bolstering trilateral cooperation with Japan through measures like intel sharing. Several researchers, including academics and an Australian professor, have been taken hostage at gunpoint in Papua New Guinea. The group was on a study trip in remote highlands when captured by armed men. The rebel separatists in Indonesia, who took a man from New Zealand hostage last week, have released images that appear to show their captive in good health, but say he won't be released until authorities acknowledge the rebels as independent, even if that means holding him as collateral for life. Philip Mertens is a pilot for an airline called Susi Air and was abducted by the West Papua National Liberation Army when he landed his plane in a remote area. One of their commanders here is saying they will not let him go without freedom for the Papua region of Indonesia and that the entire country of Indonesia needed to open its eyes and acknowledge it. The flag is the symbol of Papua independence. A friend of Merton's confirmed that the man in the photos appears to be him. New Zealand's government has declined to comment on the images, and Indonesia's chief security minister said he was focused on what he called persuasive means to secure Merton's release and prioritizing his safety. Heavy rains in coastal areas of Brazil southeast have caused flooding and landslides that killed 36 people and dislodged hundreds of others. Rescue workers continue to look for victims, reconnect isolated communities and clear roads, some of which remain blocked, trapped an underdetermined number of tourists who travel for Brazil's carnival celebrations. Weather forecasts show heavy rains will continue in Sao Paulo's coastal area, challenging civil defense and fire department rescue teams and raising the prospect of a higher death toll. The federal government determined the mobilization of several ministries to assist victims, restore infrastructure and start reconstruction work. Sao Paulo state declared a 180-day state of calamity for six cities after what experts described as an unprecedented extreme weather event. Operations at the port of Santos, Latin America's largest, were interrupted amid wind gusts exceeding 55 km per hour and waves over one meter high. President Lula da Silva, who was spending carnival in Bahia State in Brazil's northeast, is set to visit the main affected areas later today. New Zealand has said rebuilding after Cyclone Gabriel will cost billions of dollars on par with the Christchurch earthquake from 12 years ago. The nation is picking up the pieces in order to recover. Gabriel brought widespread flooding to the North Island in mid-February, damaging roads and bridges. At least 11 people have died so far and thousands are still uncontactable. Prime Minister Chris Hipkins has called Gabriel New Zealand's biggest natural disaster for at least a generation and announced an emergency $187.08 million cyclone relief package. New Zealand warned that the final cost of devastating cyclone could rise above $8 billion as authorities announced emergency funding to help in the recovery efforts. Farmers lost entire harvests and herds to the floods and authorities are still determining how much of it will be covered by insurance. Finance Minister Grant Robertson blamed the extent of the damage inflicted by Gabriel on New Zealand's failure to build infrastructure that's resilient to climate change, adding that the current approach to adapt has not been sufficiently robust. Chris Hipkins also said the state of national emergency due to Gabriel will be extended for seven days. It applies to Northland, Auckland, Tairawiti, Bay of Plenty, Waikato, Hawke's Bay and Tararua. This is only the third time in New Zealand's history that the country has issued a national emergency declaration to speed up rescue and relief efforts. The last time was in the aftermath of the Christchurch earthquake. More than 6,500 people were uncontactable after the cyclone, but added the authorities knew that about 4,200 of them were all right. Around 15,000 people are still without power in the North Island. About 70% of those are in Napier and surrounding areas. Severe thunderstorms rolled into Australia's most populated city, Sydney, bringing about damaging lightning and gusts that disrupted the daily life of local residents. Sunday's second day of racing at the Australia Sail Grand Prix was cancelled after high winds destroyed Team Canada's sail in what organizers called a major weather event. Video shared on social media showed workers and spectators running for their lives as the wing sail crashed into a marquee and fell to the ground. Sail GP said in a statement that several boats were damaged in the windy conditions 
but as far as they were aware, no one was seriously injured. CEO Russell Kuth said what blew through Sydney Harbor after Saturday's racing felt like a hurricane. Ben Ainsley is the driver for Great Britain. Yeah, look, look, what happened yesterday was really unfortunate for, for everyone involved, for the league, for all of the teams, particularly for Canada. It was a very difficult situation with a weather front coming through and trying to anticipate exactly when that was going to hit the fleet was, was and always is with the weather. You know, Mother Nature doesn't always play ball and this was a case where it really caught us out big time. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News. Now, after two weeks of searching for survivors from the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, search and rescue operations have wound down, with a focus now on the survivors. Applause and cheers for international rescue teams as Turkey ended most search and rescue operations on Sunday. Almost two weeks after a 7.8 magnitude earthquake devastated the country's southeast and neighboring Syria. Residents of hard-hit Hatay in southern Turkey watched as excavators worked to remove the rubble of destroyed buildings. As hopes of finding any more survivors faded, families prayed for the recovery of bodies to mourn. We wanted the search and rescue to continue for a month. We expected it to continue for a month. People could already be dead, but at least they could reach those bodies and they could have a grave and people would know where it is. These red balloons were tied to demolished buildings in memory of children who died in the earthquake. Every time we tie a balloon, my head hurts, said the project's initiator. He said between 1,000 and 1,500 balloons have been tied so far. The earthquake has killed more than 46,000 people in Turkey and Syria and has left a million plus people homeless. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken surveyed the damage in Turkey on Sunday and promised an additional $100 million to the response, on top of the $85 million already approved. The World Health Organization estimates that some 26 million people across both Turkey and Syria need humanitarian aid. On Sunday, medical charity Médecins Sans Frontières said a convoy of its trucks had entered Syria after concerns over a lack of access to the war-ravaged area. In the city of Azaz, hundreds of displaced families were struggling to find somewhere to stay amid a shortage of tents. One volunteer setting up camps for those who lost their homes told that aid from the United Nations and relief agencies still hadn't reached the area yet. During the 59th Munich Security Conference over the weekend, global leaders used the international events as an opportunity to call for military support for Ukraine. The U.S. meanwhile warned China against supplying weapons to Russia. The three-day Munich Security Conference came to a close on Sunday local time. Topping the agenda this time round was the almost year-long war in Ukraine. During an interview with Germany's Bild am Sonntag newspaper on the last day of the conference, Kyiv Mayor Vitaly Klitschko called on NATO allies to supply Ukraine with fighter jets to fend off Russian forces. Klitschko added that Ukrainians need everything that is necessary to take back their home country. Global leaders who took part in the conference also voiced similar opinions. The European Union's chief diplomat, Josep Borrell, stressed the importance of increasing and accelerating the EU's military support for Ukraine, saying there is still a lot to be done. Estonia's prime minister also recommended that the EU should pool resources to speed up ammunition production and deliveries to Ukraine. Besides arms shortage, another possible obstacle to ending the war, the supply of weapons to Russia from China. The U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, said that Beijing would cross a red line if it provides lethal military aid to Moscow. This comes after U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken raised the issue when he met with his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi on Saturday on the sidelines of the conference. 
After the meeting, Blinken told that Chinese companies were already providing non-lethal support to Russia, and based on new information, there are concerns these companies could be considering providing lethal support as well. He added that this would result in serious consequences for China. Meta is rolling out a new paid verification subscription service called Meta Verified. The parent company Meta has announced that Instagram and Facebook users will now be able to pay for a blue tick verification. Meta Verified will cost $11.99 a month on web or $14.99 for iPhone users. It will be available in Australia and New Zealand this week. Mark Zuckerberg, Meta chief executive, said the move will improve security and authenticity on social media apps. The move comes after Elon Musk, owner of Twitter, implemented the premium Twitter Blue subscription in November 2022. Meta's paid subscription service is not yet available for businesses, but any individual can pay for verification. Badges, or blue ticks, have been used as verification tools for high-profile accounts to signify their authenticity. The subscription would give paying users a blue badge, increased visibility of their posts, protection from impersonators, and easier access to customer service. Allowing paying users to access to a blue tick has previously caused trouble for other social media platforms. Twitter's pay-for-verification feature was paused last November when people started impersonating big brands and celebrities by paying for the badge. Meta said Instagram and Facebook usernames will have to match a government-supplied ID document to be granted verification and users will have to have a profile picture that includes their face. Welcome back to World News. Now, it was a star-studded evening in this year's BAFTA Film Awards, packed with the actors' creatives behind some of the last year's best films. The event comes across as somewhat special since this was the first time a German motion picture won majority awards in the British awards ceremony. And the BAFTA goes to... All Quiet on the Western Front. World War I epic All Quiet on the Western Front has dominated at the BAFTAs, taking home seven awards, including Best Film. It also won Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Film Not in the English Language and Best Director for Edward Berger. Its seven wins mean it has broken the BAFTA record for the most awards won by a film not in English. All Quiet on the Western Front is a screen adaptation of the 1928 novel by Eric Maria Remark. How did this happen? In his acceptance speech for Best Film Not in the English Language, Berger said the filmmakers grew up with the responsibility to tell the story and were honored the public had accepted it with overwhelming love. And the BAFTA goes to... Harry Condon. Irish stars Kerry Condon and Barry Kilgan won Best Supporting Actress and Actor and the movie was named Outstanding British Film despite its Irish setting and storyline. Dublin-born Kilgan, who spent time in care as a child, dedicated his Supporting Actor Prize to the kids from the area that I came from who are dreaming to be something. And the BAFTA goes to... Elvis! Baz Luhrmann's Elvis Presley biopic was another big winner, also taking home four prizes. Best casting, costume design, makeup and hair, and best leading actor. The biggest surprises at Sunday's ceremony were in the acting categories. And the BAFTA goes to... Austin Butler. Relative newcomer Austin Butler's best actor win could help him edge past his more seasoned competitors Colin Farrell and Brendan Fraser. The event was attended by the Prince and Princess of Wales and other signatories in what is considered the biggest British film event of the year. Catherine, Princess of Wales, put a thrifty spin on regal elegance at the BAFTAs on Sunday night, pairing an upcycled Alexander McQueen gown with $28 earrings from fashion retailer Zara. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we leave you tonight with Brazil's famous carnival celebrations across the country with the biggest crowds drawn in Rio de Janeiro. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.